A word from the editor. For this chapter, the role of the judge will not be played by his normal actor due to unfortunate circumstances. To each a tempo, an ace attorney and a leap beat agent's fan fiction. Chapter 13. Phoenix usually slept all right before the second days of his trials. Waking up was the catch. His thoughts were racing even as he jerked awake. If his mind was going to mull over the case without him, it could at least share its findings. Gathering in the defendant's lobby, with Maya and Stuart close by, Fox electronically by their sides, was beginning to feel normal, at least. So? Maya's fists were up like she was ready to wrestle the whole courtroom into submission. We're going to get to the bottom of this today, right? I hope so. Phoenix shifted his briefcase to his other hand. The agency notes kept getting heavier, but his own jotted writing made more sense with each review. As long as we can find out how Cherry fits into all of this. You guys really think LaFlamme's involved? I figured I'd recognize her rhythm if she was tied up in this. I check on her and Dempster all the time. She could have been calm at the time. Were they talking about the same person? Maybe you just didn't notice her because you were focusing on other things. I do that sometimes. Hey, you're scratching an awful lot. Did you catch fleas in the detention center, or what? Stuart paused and gave a sheepish grin, very deliberately hooking his thumbs into jean pockets. Nah, this civilian thing's just weirding me out. You don't realize how much you miss hair gel till you don't have any. You know what I mean, don't you, Mr. Wright? Someday the court would have to try the state versus Wright's hair, defendant pleading innocent of all charges. Hey, Mr. Wright! Detective Gumshoe was a familiar sight, weaving around the lobby throngs, huge and beaming. Phoenix and Maya stepped back to add him to their conference circle. I got your analysis, pal. He quickly shoved plastic bags full of side rags into Phoenix's hands, followed by a bent sheaf of printed charts. There wasn't time to check everything, so I just had them do the food traces you couldn't identify. Find anything interesting? She had no reason to light up like that. The food products they were talking about have long since ceased to be edible. Uh, I learned what a kumquat is. Gumshoe scratched his head. I guess there's a whole world of delicious treats out there. Oh, but this is the weird part. That green smudge wasn't food at all. It was ink. Green ink? Phoenix had never found that color while tearing Wright & Co. offices apart for a working pen. Yeah, and not just any ink, pal. This was soy-based ink. The kind they used to print newspapers. You wouldn't find it in any old ballpoint pen. But why would a special ink like that be in the restaurant kitchen? Fox hummed and began typing at a quick, clattering pace. Uh, beats me, pal. With a glance around him, Gumshoe lowered his voice. But Mr. Edgeworth has some leads. Bring up the ink during the trial, and he'll tell you how it relates to Morna Beasley. Since when did Gumshoe try to be cryptic? Phoenix blinked and looked to Maya. She was just as surprised as he was. <laughs> How's that for a clue? Like in the movies? I know I'm not supposed to be helping you, but when I had to tell Mr. Edgeworth I didn't have a microphone anymore, he wasn't mad. He wasn't even surprised. I think he wants you to know what he knows, Mr. Wright. Phoenix could imagine Edgeworth's wry smirk and sidelong gaze. They were in this together, and the two of them could finally admit it. If only Phoenix could share the valuable information he knew. As court filed to order, he got Fox's answer. The detective is right, Phoenix. Soy-based ink is mostly purchased in large quantity and used in industrial applications. But there's limited use in environmentally friendly office supplies and other specialty goods. So don't rule that out yet. Specially ordered pens, maybe? He picked up Cherry's customer side rag from the defense stand, turning it over to find the ink smear. The ink here is smeared. It does look like a pen leak that was wiped up with a rag. Phoenix glanced to Stuart, who shrugged. He was no help, and he was sorry for it. I don't know, Nick. Cherry takes her fancy imported food seriously, but I saw pens scattered around her kitchen under the same cheap blue kind you use. Do you really think she'd have a special pen? Or barleywood? Those two did seem to have bigger worries than the type of ink they wrote recipes down with. But it was the only theory they had at the moment. Phoenix adjusted the parade of notes and evidence under his stand, and he glanced across to find Edgeworth doing the same. Sweeping in, the judge took his place at the head of the courtroom, 
and brought silence with a hammering of the gavel. The court is now in session for the trial of Mr. Stuart Love. The prosecution is ready, Your Honor. Edgeworth shot a look at Phoenix, cool across the court's distance. I hope you are as well, right? The defense is ready, Your Honor. Hmm. Your opening statement, Mr. Edgeworth? Edgeworth looked back to the judge, breaking contact. Phoenix hadn't noticed the tension until it was gone. As the case stood yesterday, there were many unanswered questions, such as the events leading up to the victim's murder and the whereabouts of the weapon used. The prosecution will ensure that these questions are answered. I would once again like to call Detective Gumshoe to the stand. It was the same scene as before. Gumshoe taking the stand, standing proud, Bearing information. Detective, if you would share the updated test results with us. Yes, sir! The bailiffs milled, passing around more sheets. Forensic test results, it looked like. We did some more detailed analysis on the victim's head injuries. She was struck with a blunt object, something about three inches in diameter. The angle of the wound shows that she was hit with a forceful stabbing motion. And, uh, well, we already said that she was attacked from behind. There was no mistaking it. Miss Beasley's assailant snuck up on her and meant to hurt her. Phoenix leafed through the report. Did the blow break skin, Detective? No, it didn't. All the bleeding was inside her head, poor lady. That's how we know the murder weapon was something with rounded edges. No wonder Mr. Edgeworth had the microphone tested. The weapon wasn't Stuart's microphone, but something much like it. Phoenix underlined relevant points in the autopsy and then looked to Gumshoe, rubbing his chin. So, you didn't find the murder weapon? Phoenix? It was risky, he knew that. Anticipation surged through him. A pause hung uncomfortable. Gumshoe glanced to the prosecution. Edgeworth stood with his arms folded, calmly tapping one finger. Uh, we didn't find anything likely, no, pal. Based on the premeditated nature of the attack, I would guess that the attacker carried the murder weapon away from the scene of the crime for disposal elsewhere. That's reasonable. He stared thoughtfully into space, turning his gavel back and forth. It pays to think a plan all the way through, I've always said. Why does the judge sound like he knew this from experience? Did Phoenix want to know? Uh, anyways. He looked to the reports like they'd helped. The victim had other injuries. Didn't she, Detective? Minor fractures in her wrist and a bruise on her arm. Because of her age, we can't be sure how she hurt her wrists. Uh, maybe it was from falling down. Or from battering Tucker. But the bruise on her arm's definitely from somebody grabbing her, pal. Her sweater cushioned it so there was no clear hand mark, and wool doesn't hold prints. So uh, all we know is that it was a hard grip. Whoever grabbed her meant it. They meant it or they were worked up at the time. But if the attacker were upset or angry enough to kill someone, Jay would have noticed them before or during the murder. Phoenix, this doesn't line up. He pulled the sketch of Jay's flight path from his notes and passed it to Maya, silently asking for her thoughts. She nodded. Phoenix had to keep pressing because that was all he ever could do. Phoenix turned back to the court. So, were there any other tests run on the victim? Edgeworth lifted a sheet. Analysis shows leaf litter on the front of the victim's sweater, which is to be expected when she fell down in the forest. There was also a trace of ink on her sweater sleeve. Now they were getting somewhere. They just needed to know what kind of ink. Edgeworth smirked. Naturally, I had a thorough analysis conducted. The ink was soy-based variety typically used in commercial printing, dark green, although there was barely enough to be visible to the naked eye. Printing ink? Phoenix set his palms down hard. This was it. The link to Cherry in the orchard. And where would have that come from? I'll oblige the defense with evidence, of course. And, with a flourish, Edgeworth produced an evidence bag. Clear plastic suspending something that didn't look like a pen at all. It was a green-patterned deck of cards. The ink on the victim's sleeves matches these playing cards, used by her bridge group several times a week. And since the cards are of a very cheap, common variety, it's not unreasonable to suppose that the ink smudged onto the victim's clothing. What? what Edgeworth swept a hand to his midriff, 
that mocking bow that always made Phoenix's teeth itch. I apologize if you were expecting something more entertaining, Mr. Wright. The judge cast a suspicious eye over Phoenix. Does the defense object to that theory? Maya looked up from searching through Phoenix's briefcase. But if the ink didn't come from Cherry, how's she connected to the crime scene? And what had Cherry actually seen? And what did she know? There were flocks of questions, and all Phoenix had to go on was a table-cleaning rag. He looked to its green ink smudge, which was barely visible under plastic's reflective glare. He needed to hold on to his ace. Phoenix straightened. No objections. The court accepts the playing cards into evidence. The judge returned to watching Edgeworth. Where were these cards found, Mr. Edgeworth? These cards are the most recent deck used by a ladies' bridge club, one very closely tied to the defendant. Ms. Beasley had no known immediate family and had identified her card-playing companions as next of kin in her will. Why, that's nice. They'd never give her up or let her down. It would seem so, Your Honor. However, Edgeworth laid a palm on his stand. I considered all possibilities in this investigation. Despite her well-kept appearance, Ms. Beasley was on fixed income, and her assets spread amongst the seven other bridge club members would amount to very little. There was no significant monetary motive to kill Ms. Beasley. Whoever killed her must have had a grudge, a hate-fiery motive. Well, they already knew that. Mr. Edgeworth, if the bridge ladies were so important in the victim's life, they must have had more to do with the case than a smear of ink on her clothes. This matter was thoroughly investigated. Two of the associated women are currently vacationing in Cancun. Three are involved in a regional craft fair and can prove their whereabouts for the past several days. One is wheelchair bound and one has severe arthritis that is allegedly acting up. The bridge club has many and varied alibis, and more importantly, none of the women match the park footprints or witness accounts in any way. It sounds like he spent a lot of time researching a dead end. Not that Phoenix didn't sympathize, but he had bigger fish to fry, and Edgeworth had just given him a pan. Witness accounts. The only witness brought forth so far was Mr. Vanderspiegel, and his account proved nothing! Edgeworth's smirk lacked its usual nastiness. Actually, Mr. Wright, another witness has come forward and is quite insistent that her testimony be heard. She was present in the Orchard Bistro at the time of the murder, across the street from Foster Park's South Edge. Her take on the events of yesterday morning is most intriguing. And that was an intriguing way to phrase it. The judge nodded. Call your witness, Mr. Edgeworth. Come on, Nick, make her spill. Maya passed back the map sketch. Sickeningly yellow highlighter now marked it. A triangle beginning at the scene of the crime and broadening towards the orchard's alley. But what could that mean? The phone has to know something helpful, whatever she did or didn't do. She didn't need to add that she was poised over her keyboard, ready. This was it. The rematch. And this time, on Phoenix's turf. The prosecution calls Miss Cherry Laflamme to the stand. To Each a Tempo was written by Pyrosaur. Ace Attorney and Elite Beat Agents are owned by Capcom and Enis, respectively. The narrator for this story is Gendi Oda C.O.G. The voice of Phoenix Wright is Lasney. The voice of Maya Fey is Miki. The voice of Miles Edgeworth is Lazy Ace Dia. The voice of Detective Gumshoe is Gendi Oda C.O.G. The voice of the Judge is also Gendi Oda C.O.G. The voice of Agent J is yet again Gendiota COG. The voice of Agent Fox is Galen Skibiak. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.